Lord is good. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. And I'm so grateful for what God has done in my life. Not so much in the in the things He's allowed me to do or the things He's allowed me to be a part of, but more so for how He saved me. Amen. If you've never heard what God's done for me, I just want to share it with you for a few minutes. I was uh, raised in a small little Pentecostal holiness church until about the age of 10 or 11. The church split, so we split. <laughs> and uh, we went to a little church of God of prophecy. And it wasn't maybe a couple more years before we had completely walked away from God altogether. And uh, I got pretty good at baseball. Ended up going to college to play baseball. Small little scholarship at a small little school. In a small little town. In a small little state. <laughs> Elkins, West Virginia. Who's heard of it? That's what I thought. Oh, yeah. And uh, was part of the baseball team. And if anybody knows baseball players, you know that's no good. And uh, we were the party boys. And I was getting to a place of desperation. Baseball literally was falling apart. My freshman year, I took over a starting position. And uh, with that summer, I went and played at a league in New York because I had played so well in my freshman season. And up in New York, it was like God cut my hair. I lost all ability. I mean, you could have thrown a barn at me and I wouldn't have hit it. And um, I got back to college and for the next couple of years, just one thing after another, baseball was deteriorating. Other things in my life were falling apart. And I came to a place in my life where I, I was just, God, one of two things is going to have to happen here. Either I can't keep going or you're going to have to prove you're real. And let me tell you something. We don't ever try to arrogantly ask God to prove himself. But when you're broken, you can ask God to prove himself because he'll answer that cry. And I started going to a couple different churches and my mom ended up getting saved in the midst of me falling apart. She gave her heart back to the Lord and there was a real change in her life. And I was going to a couple different churches and I was still partying, still drinking. And she said, Paris, you know, Christians, they, they're not supposed to drink. I said, sure they are. Jesus, he turned water into wine. What are you talking about? And I was too stupid to know that that really just meant grape juice. And um, of course, Jesus wouldn't give somebody alcohol. But um, I would fight with her and she gave up one day. She sent me a text message. She said, Paris, you need to read Proverbs 20 and 1 and you don't need to be drinking. And I, I looked at that text message and I said, you know what? If I read that and the Bible really says that you're not supposed to drink, then I'm going to feel pretty guilty when I go out tonight and party with the guy. So I'm not reading that. It was about a month and a half, maybe two months later. I uh, sat down with the guys. We were getting ready to start drinking that night. I pulled my phone out of my pocket. Passcode was opened up on its own. Bible application on my phone was opened up on its own. And Proverbs 20 and 1 was staring me in the face. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Next verse. For the fear of the king is as a roaring of a lion. Whosoever provoketh him to anger sins against his own soul. And here I am sitting in the midst of a bunch of heathens. Getting ready to start drinking. And I look up at these guys and miracles just happened in, my, in, the, in, my, in front of me. An absolute miracle. Well, Amen. you can't really... Tell the guys that they think you're nuts. They'd be like, bro, you started drinking too early. <laughs> and uh, I did. I ignored it for a little while, a couple months. And then one night I was up in the volleyball suite and I was with my friend and his girlfriend was there and she started talking about Catholicism. I'm at this point now in my life where if I'm drinking, I'm talking about Jesus. I really came to that, that low, that messed up. And I'm talking about the Lord. And she started talking about how she was Catholic. And I said, you know, the Bible says, what, what are you talking about? What are you, what? And I don't even know, you know, I don't know if I'd read it. I probably heard it somewhere. I said, but you know, the Bible says that there's one mediator between God and man. Yes. And his name is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I said, how can a sinful man, man just like me, absolve me of my sin? She walked away crying. And I looked down in my hand and there's a beer bottle. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, Paris, what are you doing here? That next morning, I was in this small little church, Rivers of Living Water Ministries. I don't remember what they preach. I don't remember who preached. I don't know who sang. I don't 
remember anything. All I remember was I was hungover. I knew they could smell me. But here's what was happening. I was trembling from head to toe. Sweating. Tears pouring down my face Amen. like rivers. And I said, God, if you can deliver me from this, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. That was my great sinner's prayer. And the Holy Spirit rushed into my heart in that moment and completely set me free and set me on a new path, a new journey, a new life, completely changed. And I remember walking outside that morning and I looked up and I looked at the sky and they say, you know, you hear people say this, but it really is true. The, the sky was bluer. The grass was greener. Everything was new. I was like a baby that had just come out of the womb, seeing everything for the first time. And my God is everything beautiful when you're walking in the eyes of the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's, it's the you, best Jesus. life now. You want your best life now? Right. You'll serve Jesus. Amen. You'll serve Jesus. Praise God. Um, we're so happy to be here. It's kind of a, a strange thing to be here while well, Brother Matt's here. And, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. We thank you guys for the invitation as always. And uh, your, your beautiful wife, we thank her for her hospitality every time we come. And Brother Robert too, I know he's in the back with the kids, but he's always a blessing to us. Um, just so y'all know, uh, <clears throat> the people that were up here singing, they're all, one, we got Cameron here for the first time, it's pretty cool. And uh, Cameron, he is one of our youth members at Crossfire, and he also plays in Salvation Station at the church as well. Uh, Emily, she's a part of our worship team in Crossfire and the Michaela. She's a part of the worship team at the Bible College. So isn't it awesome to see young people Amen. Amen. living for God? And they're like, what are you talking about? Are you a young person? <laughs> but if you would, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 5. And uh, just excited. We, we were at a retreat yesterday. We, uh, my wife and I, we've started leading a new um, aspect of Crossfire Youth Ministries called Crossfire Unite. And uh, yesterday we had an all-day retreat, our first little retreat. And uh, we're all, like, exhausted? No. <laughs> it was a fun time. Um, and Crossfire Unite, basically what that is, is fellowship groups. But... We have focused our fellowship groups to uh, the growth of our, our young people, growing in the knowledge of the Lord and growing in uh, the faith of the Lord. It's been an awesome thing. We've watched Crossfire literally change over the course of the last eight months. Just the, the atmosphere is just completely different. And uh, we've got young people who are they're really getting a hold of God and, and really starting to move forward in the things of God. It's just been amazing to watch what God's been doing in Crossfire. So. Um, if one of us pass out before we walk out of here, you'll know why now. No, just kidding. All right, Leviticus uh, 18, 1 to 5. I'm sorry, one last thing. Uh, we do have some products in the back. Mary Beth is back there, my wife. And uh, she has all the pricing for you. Um, it's something new that we've just started doing. So if you're interested, go ahead and take a look. You'll, you'll be blessed by all that material for sure. So, All right, that's enough of that. All right, and the Lord... Spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein you dwelt, shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, where I bring you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. You know, we live in a period in the church age where holiness is almost like saying a four letter word. And even in the message of the cross circles, people don't really like to hear it. We don't really like to hear the word. Hey, you know what? You need to live a holy life. But you have to understand that the message of the cross never came forth to let you live in your sin. The message of the cross came forth to give you power over sin. Amen. Right? That's what the message of the cross has come forth to do. So the message of the cross is not, yes, I thank God that when I'm having a struggle, when I'm having a bondage, the message of the cross has made it clear to me that I'm justified by faith. 
It's not what I do. It's not what I don't do. It's not what I'm not capable of doing at this present moment. It's what I'm believing in. When I'm going through the greatest struggle of my life and I can't overcome this particular issue in my life, it doesn't matter if I don't get the victory today. I am justified by faith. But that does not, listen, that does not give us the opportunity nor the privilege of being comfortable with it. If we get to a place where we're comfortable with our bad habits, we're comfortable with sin in our lives, we're comfortable with that wrong attitude, right? If we get to a place where we're comfortable with those things, we need to evaluate our relationship with the Lord. Amen. I'm not here to, to preach holiness, but I am. I am here to preach holiness because you want to know the true holiness message? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. We should be the, uh, the most overcoming, victorious people on the planet because we know how to achieve victory in our lives. And it's simple, but yet so complicated. That's why we preach on it. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Sunday night, even in different Bible studies that we do because we forget so easy I need to keep this before me every day, all day, all the time. But holiness, holiness, not something we want to hear. There are even some churches today that they don't even talk about holiness. There are some churches today that say if you mention sin in your life, that you really don't understand the grace of God and you're, you're crazy. No, we have to deal with sin. That's right. We have to deal with the flesh. There's never a point in time in our lives where it's okay to not be dealing with our sin or dealing with our flesh. In fact, every day there's new ground God wants to take in your heart. You have to understand that we're so fallen, so corrupted that every day there's new ground God wants to take. Every day. There, I'm never at a place where there's something, there's not something in my life that God wants to deal with. The more that I submit and surrender myself to Him, the more opportunities I'm giving Him to cleanse me and to make me more holy before Him. I want to be holy. Yes. I want to be holy. I want to be pure. And I want to be pure in my walk. I'm not just talking about my position. I'm talking about my everyday walk. God, change me. Don't let me stay this way. Amen. Don't let me stay here. Because if I stay here, I'm like Egypt. I don't want to be like Egypt. Don't do what, you, what they did in Egypt. If I stay like this now that I'm in Canaan, that's what they do in Canaan. I can't do that. I don't want to be like that. Don't conform to Canaan. Don't conform to Egypt. Conform to my statutes. Conform to my ordinances. See, there is a place in the message of the cross where we've got to start saying, okay, i got to deal with this lust issue. Okay, I've got to... Do you, you know what anger is? Anger is the most manipulative tactic. It's honestly a form of psychology. Because you think that that person that's doing something that you don't like, if you respond in the right amount of anger, with the right fervency in your voice, that that will in somehow change. They'll stop eventually. You keep getting anger. Oh, ah! They did it again. Ah! They did it again. Stop it! And you think that by doing that time and time again, eventually they're going to learn if I do that, he's going to get mad. You've manipulated that person. Exactly. You've manipulated that person. That's what anger is. It's just a form of manipulation. It's psychology. <laughs> and we don't even understand. It's so engraved in us, so interwoven in us, we don't even see it. And of course, there are different forms of it, different forms that it takes. But... Are we being changed? Am I recognizing that my anger at any point ever is sinful? Now there's a righteous indignation, but I think we have used that a little bit. Come on. I'm talking about anger that causes you to look like a jerk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Paris, are you, what are you talking about? Well, I'm guilty, guilty too. <laughs> Come on, how many married people we have in here? Don't tell me you've never tried to use anger to fix a situation. Come on, Come on. Hmm? Come on <laughs> My brother back here, man. You want to get up here and preach? <laughs> but we're talking about being changed, being conformed into the image of God, allowing us to walk in true and pure holiness. 
So how does that happen? How does that work? We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about some different things that we don't need to be conforming to. And we're also going to talk about the good news is that there is an option where I can literally move through that holiness. I can have holiness. OK, so uh, we're going to preach a simple message entitled you're supposed to be different. Amen. You are supposed to be different. I'm supposed to be different. We are supposed to be different. And uh, the Lord will help me to preach this. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. I thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you for the cross of Calvary. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've made available to me. The resources that you've made available to me. That I can live a holy life. That I can walk in purity before you. Lord, that I can move past this issue. I can move past this circumstance. I can move past these things, Lord, and I can be delivered. I can be set free and I can walk in purity. God, I want my life to be a testimony to you. I don't want to I don't want people to see Egypt in me. I don't want people to see Canaan in me. I want people to see you in me. I want my life to be changed, conformed into your image. And Lord, we're asking you for your help this morning in anointing us to preach this message. Anoint the people with a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of your son. Lord, that we might see truly who you are and what you're capable of doing. And Father, we love you this morning. We give you praise. We say it in Jesus name. Amen. amen. And amen. Leviticus might be your least favorite book in the Bible to read. through, <laughs> But I promise you, it's one of the best books in the Bible. to read. Amen. You want to learn about the cross? Read Leviticus. Yeah. You want to learn about the different aspects of what Christ did at Calvary and the sacrifices? Read the book of Leviticus. And if you don't have an expositor study Bible, buy one and read the book of Leviticus. Amen. Because <laughs> it will make more sense to you. The book of Leviticus is the third book in a group of books called the Pentateuch. Moses is their author. Um, most of y'all probably know this, but just in case you don't. Um, the book of Leviticus, there is no geographical movement. We are not moving in the book of Leviticus. We're in one place. In fact, in Exodus, the, uh, they had built the tabernacle, offered up sacrifices, and then the glory of God did what? It filled the temple, or filled the tabernacle, and it was almost immediately that God began to speak to Moses in the tent. Called, from, called for him from the congregation of meeting, and he began to speak to him and give to him the book of Leviticus. Now, um, the book of Leviticus is the reason it's named Leviticus is because most believe that it was actually a handbook for the Levites, the tribe of Levites. If you were a, if you were a priest in the Old Testament, you were a Levite, uh, but not every Levite was a priest. So if you were a priest, if you were a minister of the gospel, if you were called to preach or to teach or to do anything within the within the tabernacle regarding service, you needed to know this book. Because if you went in there and you went in there that uh, in a way that was not according to this book, there was a consuming fire in that house that would consume you. And there's a lesson to be learned there. You can't just go into the presence of God just any old way because God's a consuming fire. This is a this is a powerful thing, because if you will cleanse yourself with the blood. If you will go through the sacrifice you can enter into a room that's full of the fire of God. Amen. Hey, I want a room full of the fire of God. I want to be a room that is full of the fire of God. You know, I think when we look at Moses, and I love this, when we look at Moses and he says he sat before that burning bush and saw that it was not being consumed, I almost feel as if though that was a type of what God was going to use Moses to do. He was going to go into Egypt as a consuming fire. God, give me, give me some revelation about this fire that you have. Fill my heart with it, with passion and with zeal. Consume the sin that's in my life, Lord. And let me, be, let me be in the presence of everyone that sees me a consumed bush, burning bright for your glory. That's what I want to be. But if you tried to enter in any way that was not according to this book, you were consumed. 
They would even at times they would tie a rope around the priests as they went in to do their work. Because if they went in and there was something wrong in their life, they were killed instantly. And they would have to drag them out by that rope. You see, approaching God is serious. Can't just go about it any way we want to. There's only one way to approach our God. There's only one way to enter into His presence. There aren't multiple ways. There aren't a few ways. There aren't a couple ways. No, there is one specific way. Amen. One way. And that's where the church has gone wrong in a great, uh, at a, to a great degree. We don't know that way. How do we enter into the presence of God? In fact, we have a church that's not in the presence of God at all. There is no spirit operating in their church. They are dead. Dead. There's no presence of God. They don't understand. So this book was given as a guideline. So we can't just worship God any way we want to. We can't offer up sacrifices just any way we want to. God has a design. God has an order. And it is the same way for us today. God has a design. God has an order. And if you go outside of His design, if you go outside of His order, know you're not going to be killed right away, though you could be, depending on what you're doing, but you will be consumed by sin. Sin will overwhelm you. It will, it will uh, exalt itself above you. It will rule you and dominate you. Just as Paul said in Romans chapter 6. But we don't have to live that way. So God, you, are, you belong to the Lord. I am the Lord your God. Do you know who you belong to today? Yes. Do you? Do you know Him? See, there's another question. You might know who it is you belong to, but do you know who? Do you know the who? Do you really know him? Do you know his character? Do you know his ability? Have you experienced this God, this great God of heaven, full of grace and full of mercy? Have you, walk, have you walked with him? Have you talked with him? Have you worshipped him? And I'm not just talking about right here on Sunday morning, just as Michaela was saying. Listen, now we were talking to our young people yesterday and I was telling them, listen, if you want to, if, you, if Crossfire is to be anything, we need to be, we need a baptism of God's love. We need to be a well of the love of God where people can come in and find what they need. Because if I'm a well of the love of God, I'm going to be giving them one message because love only had one message. Amen. John 3, 16. <clears throat> love had one message. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the message of love. And if we are to be anything as a body of Christ, we need to be consumed by love, baptized with love, with compassion and passion. But here's the here's the kicker. It's not just going to be because the band members are baptized with the love of God. It's not just going to be because the preachers up here preaching on the love of God. It's going to be because the people in the house are being filled with the love of God. If that's not happening, and let's just, uh, let's just compare that to everything that we're talking about today. If we're not being changed on every level, the church is hurting. If you're in here and you're not allowing God to change you, then you're not properly functioning in the calling that He has on your life. You are not giving the way you should give. You are not praying the way you should pray. You are not witnessing the way you should witness. There's something we all have to be changed. Amen. All of us. All of us have to be changed. If our youth ministry in Baton Rouge is going to ever be anything, and surely we're doing a great thing on TV, but if we're going to reach our city the way that we need to, the way that God's asked us to, then we all, from the bottom to the top, need to be changed. We have to be changed. We cannot stay the same. And if this church here is to ever be what it's supposed to be, every member from bottom to the top, whatever that means, you need to be changed. You can't stay the same. Because if you're staying the same, you're crippling the body. We're crippling what God can do. Now surely God's doing great things through, through several, through, through uh, more than a few. But He wants to do great things in every one of us. And if he's doing great things in every one of us, changing us, conforming us, moving us forward, my God, watch out Patterson, Louisiana. Watch out Morgan City. Watch out this entire area, this region. God's going to do great things. Amen. God, let this place become a consumed fire of the Lord, full of the love of God and the power of God, and already having the right message. You watch out. 
I'm serious. If we would just get serious about walking with God, that's it. That's the key. It's not about how many times we preach the message of the cross. It's not about how great we can see. It's about being changed. It's about not staying the same. And if I'll do that, my God, watch out what God can do. Amen. It does, it's not just one person. It's not just Pastor Matt. It's not just Brother Robert. It's not just a few of us. It is every single one of us. That's the importance of the message of the cross. It didn't just come for the preacher. It didn't just come for the, uh, the clergy. It didn't just come for the choir and the praise and worship team. The message of the cross has come for the body. Yeah. He's come to perfect the body. He's come to change the body. He wants the body to be full of power. Amen. My God, if we would just get a hold of it, if we would say, God, I'm, I'm serious. I need to be changed. Lord, I don't want to stay the same. Lord, I'm ready to move forward in the things of God. I don't want to stay here. I don't want to stay here. Don't be like the children of Israel. They wanted to stay there because they saw too much. They saw too much warfare. Too much danger, too much warfare, too much toil. My God, if they would have just thought, what did God do? When he brought us out of Egypt. And we think that those guys over there in the land are too tough. Just look at what he did in Egypt. You know, that's a type. You think that going forward is too hard. Just look what he did in Egypt. Amen. That's when he brought you out. How did he bring you out? He brought you out by the blood. Yeah. You got it. You're afraid of moving forward. Just plead the blood. Hallelujah. Look to Calvary. <laughs> oh, man. Amen. We have a good salvation. We're God's property. We belong to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. What? Know ye not that you are, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. What you have of God, you are not your own. Mm. For you are bought with a price. You were purchased. You were purchased by God. You are not your own. This body doesn't belong to you if you're born again. Your mind doesn't belong to you if you're born again. Your heart does not belong to you if you're born again. Your feet, they don't belong to you if you're born again. Your hands, they don't belong to you if you're born again. Your eyes, they don't. Your ears, they don't belong to you if you're born again. He bought your whole body. Amen. He bought all of you. To be a possession of his own. You're not your own. You belong to him. But the beauty of it is, is that he's not going to force you to do anything. He'll never force you to do anything. Now you might feel so moved that you feel like if I don't, I'll die. I've had that. But the truth is, he's never going to force your hand on anything. He's not going to force you to change. He's not going to force you to pray. He's not going to force you to really commit yourself to him. Nope. He's going to give you the opportunity. Just as He did at salvation, He's going to give you the opportunity. And He's faithful to present that opportunity again and again and again and again because He does not give up on us. Amen. That's an awesome thing. Amen. He'll never give up on us. But you're not your own. Nothing of you belongs to you if you've been born again. All of it belongs to Him. All of it is for His glory. Amen. All of you is for His glory. Amen. So I ask the question, what is your eyes looking at that is not for His glory? What are your ears listening to that is not for His glory? What are your feet taking you to do that is not for His glory? And what are your hands doing that is not for His glory? We have to ask ourselves these questions. We have to come to a place where we say, you know what, Lord, I'm, I'm just tired of it. Right. I want everything in my life to please you. I want to please you anyway. So uh, we live in a day of absolute rebellion in the realm of humanism. In other words, everything was created so that it would make me happy because that's really what humanism is. Just my happiness. That the end result of everything is me being happy. That is the end result of humanism. I am really good. I just need to find all that good tied up in me. 
And I just, you know, if I'm not happy with the job I have now, well, it doesn't matter what God says because I just need to go find something that makes me happy. I just need to be doing more things that make me happy. And that really is the, what humanism is all about. Me being happy. But for the born again believer, the end of everything for us should be the glory of God. Making God happy. Now listen, we will experience happiness and joy as we surrender our will to the will of the master. Because once our will is swallowed up, we're a bond servant. Once we become that bond servant, we will experience joy and happiness. But that's not the prime product. I heard a man say this one time. I believe his name was Paris Reedhead. Believe it or not. Pretty good preacher. He's an awesome preacher. And he said that happiness of man is not the prime product, it's a byproduct. The prime product is the glory of God. Yeah. That's what I want in my life. That's what I want my eyes to always be about. My ears to always be about. My entire being to always be about the glory of God. Now see, we can have victory in our lives if we have that mindset. You see, Paul always had the will to live for God. He always had the will to be pleasing to God. The problem was that he found that his will was not powerful enough, but he had the will. You know, I think a lot of the problem in the body of Christ today is not so much not understanding how to walk in the message of the cross, especially now today, because you even see it in, the, in our churches. I mean, you've got people who are listening to the message of the cross. They can quote it to you verbatim, but they are not living it and you know it. You want to know what that is? That's the lack of a will. And you say, well, what if I find myself in that position, Paris, where I don't really have the will to get victory over any area of my life? I'm just kind of walking in uh, whatever I want to do, and I don't really have that desire. You ask God for it. Amen. Brother Bob said something in a message the other day about a preacher who I can't remember which one it was. That he came over to America and he thought that God was going to use him in a great way. But by the time he left, he was ready to walk away from God altogether. And he said he, his problem was is that he didn't believe he had faith. And there was a group of um, Moravian missionaries who were on the boat with him on the way back. And he said he was telling them everything that had happened and how he felt like he had no faith. And the Moravian missionary said one thing to him. Preach faith until you have it. Amen. Hey, uh, OK, I feel that you don't preach faith until you have it. And maybe you're not a preacher. You know, I'm just, I'm not called to preach. I'm not called to do what you do. Well, just pray for it until you have it. Amen. Ask God for it until you have it. You don't have a desire in your heart to live for God. Ask God for it until you have it. Because I'm telling you that you need it. Amen. You just need it. You don't have a desire to have victory over that area in your life. Ask God for the desire because you know the way to get the victory. You know the, the right message. You understand the message of the cross. Ask God for the desire to have victory over that. Amen. The, a desire is so important. And I think we just kind of overlook it because we don't want to preach that it's willpower that gives you victory. But let me tell you something. If there's no will to have victory, you won't have it. The problem with the, the church uh, of yesterday, the church is kind of dying out now. They wanted to please God, but they were doing it the wrong way. That's why they were weeping and crying out to God because they were just like the Egyptians. And they took a man, buried him in the wilderness, and he was crying out to God too because he knew that he had a problem and the church had a problem and they didn't know what to do. And God said, it's the message of the cross. Yes. Hallelujah. And I'm afraid of a generation that's going to be raised in the, in the verbal message of the cross. I'm afraid of that generation. They need to experience the desperation of the cross. Because cross always brings desperation. Calvary, we're always desperate for more of God. If I'm just preaching a message of the cross that does not stir the congregation up to a sense of desperation, then the message of the cross can't do them much very good. We're in trouble, folks. We've got sin in our lives. We have flesh in our lives that we need to deal with. And the cross is the solution. Right. <laughs> but we've got to be hungry. We've got to want it. 
If we don't, I, I'm afraid of that. I look at my generation and I say, we're being raised up in the terminology. We can quote it. We can tell you what scriptures to go to. But we experience the same desperation that the generation before us had. Good wanting God. Wanting victory. Wanting holiness in our lives. They, my dad told me one day. <laughs> He told me that when he was coming up in church, he said that the holiness life was so good. He said it, well, you, you just it felt so good. You wanted to live right before God. And I have a generation today that's telling me that I don't need the holiness of God. And I do need the holiness of God. In Hebrews it says that without holiness, you cannot see Him. My daddy suffered with anger growing up as I was a kid. He suffered with anger. And now my daddy doesn't. He still has his problems. We all do. But that, he's been set free. Amen. He's been given victory. Hallelujah. He's experienced freedom. I had a great dad. I'm not here to give you a sob story. I had a great dad. He just had an anger issue. But he's got victory now. Amen. But what he told me that the holiness way, it was so good. It just broke my heart because I realized that there was a generation of people that were desperate. They loved God. They wanted God. And I am afraid of a generation that will be raised up that is not too concerned with it. They'll give you the right message, but I don't know that they have the right, the right desperation, the right spirit behind it. And I even look at my own life and I say, my God, how desperate am I? Am I really desperate enough for you? You know, one of the greatest cries in prayer for me is God create a spirit and a burden of desperation for you. I want you more than I want anything. I want you more than I want the next breath I take. And you might say, oh, well, that just sounds like a, a little fluffy prayer. No, it's the, it's the truth. Amen. God, please. God created me a cry because I don't want to see that generation that was desperate for God and now they've got the message of the cross. I don't want to see them go away. I don't want to see them uh, go to glory and then leave us with a generation of people that are not that desperate. Oh God, help us to see Him for who He really is. He is the Lord our God. In, in, in Leviticus 19, he says in the verse one, he says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, I am holy. And you say, well, Paris, that's just a message for the Old Testament. No, Peter said the same thing. He said, be holy for the Lord, your God is holy. Hebrews said the same thing. So that's probably the Apostle Paul telling us the same thing. Oh, not Paul. The great message of the cross, the builder of the master builder of the church. Not Paul. He, he preached grace, Paris. He preached grace. We'll read Ch Titus chapter 2. That's grace. Titus chapter 2 tells me that grace teaches me to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. It teaches me to live soberly and godly in this present age, which literally means this fallen and defiled atmosphere. Thank you, Lord. Titus chapter 2 is grace. Grace that teaches. And, don't, and you run away. Run away from anyone preaching the grace that tells you that you can stay in your sin. Run. Flee it. Run away from it. It will consume you. It will destroy your faith. Run from it. Run away from a grace message that tells you to not look for the rapture. That's run away because grace tells me to that I am looking for the blessed hope. Grace tells me that. Titus chapter 2. Grace brought me salvation. Grace is teaching me to live holy. Grace is telling me that there is a glorious day coming when Christ is going to return and take me to be with Him. Amen. That's grace. Amen. Romans chapter 5 tells me that grace can keep me when I'm in the midst of failure. But Romans chapter 6 teaches me that grace can give me victory over my sin. 
And it tells me that I have responsibilities. You know, in, in, in the book of Romans, you look at the book of Romans, it's made up of some uh, 80, 80 plus verbs, <laughs> I want to say. And five of them are found in a group of passages. You know what? <clears throat> Kind of off the beaten path, but we'll go there. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, verse 11 says, Not only so, oh, where am I at? Here we go. All right, likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey the lust thereof, neither yield your neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. In that in those three verses is five and out of all those verbs that are found in Romans chapter six, all of them are indicative, meaning that they're facts. But you get into those three verses and they're nothing but present active imperatives. You want to know what that means? You do this right now. It's my commandment. You do this right now. This is my commandment. Now that I've taught you all of the facts regarding your position in Christ. Now you yourself. And listen to this. In Philippians chapter 2 it teaches us that God. Or chapter 1. It teaches us that God never gives a commandment that he doesn't give us the power to keep. See, because it's the one, he's the one who gives you the desire and the will to do it. So he never gives you a commandment that he doesn't give you the power to fulfill. So if he's telling me, Paris, stop watching that. He's also going to supply for me the power to fulfill it. So I want you to understand that even in the present active imperative, you right now yourself do this right now. It's my commandment. He also fills you with the Holy Spirit that empowers you to do it. Amen. So stop right now. Stop right now. Stop right now. You do not have to walk out of this building and continue to do that thing that you know is trouble. You don't have to. You can stop right now. You can present yourself to Him right now. You can give yourself to Him right now. And it can be gone. I promise you. Oh God, take it away. Right now, He can take it away. Right this moment. You can yield to Him. He's given you the power. He's given you the message. He's given you the power source. You can stop right now. You don't have to continue. Oh, but you say, and even some of you are going to walk out of here knowing what I'm talking about, hearing what I've said, and you're going to keep struggling. Don't give up. Don't quit fighting. Don't, every day, you know, a good picture, a good word picture of how to deal with sin is Phinehas. You see, because the children of Israel had just lost thousands of their people because they had joined themselves through deception to a Gentile, I think it was the Moabites had joined themselves to Moabitish women. And because that, God sent a plague among them. And thousands of Israelites died. And Moses had to, y'all know the story, he had to fashion a serpent on a cross or on a stick and run through the camp and tell everybody if they would look at that stick, they would live. You remember the story? Well, listen to this. There was an Israelite man walking through camp after all of this. The children of Israel, Moses included, Aaron the, the high priest, and even Phinehas, who was the grandson of Aaron. They're sitting there at the congregation of the tent, weeping to God, asking Him to forgive them. Lord, restore us. God, help us. And here comes another Israelite man with a Moabitess woman walking right past them. What arrogance. But here's what Phinehas did. He stood up with a spear and he, he ran to them and he thrust, he, 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 he pushed it through both of them. Killed the Israelite and the Moabitess woman. That's what we do with sin. That's what we do with those things creeping up in our lives. We jump up and we run at them. Oh my God. Just like David, he came down and he saw this giant that was defying the Lord God and he said, and the children of God, the children of Israel. And he said, is there not a cause? 
Just send me out there with a, with a slingshot and a couple stones in my little sheep bag. And I'll tell you what, I'll take that giant out. Because God's taught me to have victory over a bear. God's taught me to have victory over a lion. And now he wants to give me victory over this giant. I've got a God that fights for me. So listen, you stand up when you see those things creeping up in your life. Don't get comfortable with it. But my God, thrust it through with a spear. The spear of Calvary, the cross, what Christ did there. You thrust it through that thing, I tell you, it will never bother you again. My God. That's good preaching. Holiness is needed in the body of Christ today and we can deal with it and we should have a fervency in our hearts to deal with the sin in our lives, with the flesh that we're still dealing with today. All the victory that can be had. And we, are, we, we don't belong to ourselves, we belong to God. And he said, don't conform to their ways. Don't conform to their ways. And there are certain things that I want to talk to you about in conforming. And if you just give me a moment to get there. He's asking us that he does not want us to conform to the way that they lived in Egypt. And I'm going to. So listen, what has God done for you when he saved you? He called you out of the world, right? And then for a period of what should have probably only been 40 days. He's going to set you aside for a period of time to teach you. Because that's what he did for the children of Israel. He taught them his power, his ability to provide, <clears throat> and he taught them how to live. It took about, should have been a period of about 40 days, turned into 40 years of unbelief. And he taught them, and he was ready to send them, now that he had taught them, he was ready to send them back into the world, into Canaan. But he had a message for them. Listen, I brought you out of Egypt, and I don't want you to live like Egypt. There's a whole lot of Egypt that we got to get out of us. But I'm also going to send you into Canaan. And you're going to experience some things in Canaan that you cannot conform to. Because if you'll conform to those things, you will be like the world. If you conform to those things, you will be full of sin. You will be like the world. And I cannot live with you. I cannot dwell with you that way. So do not conform not only to the ways of Egypt, but you also don't conform. See, God's called you out of the world, but he sent you into a world. He called you out of one, but He's also sent you back into it. Changed. Called you out of it, and He sent you back into it. Changed. Because there's a work still to be done, because there are others who need to know Him. And when you get to where you're going, they don't need to see Egypt. They don't need you to do what they're doing. Oh, this is good. When you get to where God's sending you, they don't need to see the world in you. Amen. And they don't need you to conform to the things that they are already doing. Amen. Okay? Because if you do that, you're just showing them everything they already know. They need to see something different. Remember, you're supposed to be different. There's supposed to be a difference in us. We're Amen. not supposed to look like the world. Amen. We're not supposed to live like the world or be like the world. So he tells them, don't conform to the worship of their gods. Don't you conform to the worship of their gods. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them for I the, I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. What's an idol? It is absolutely anything. Amen. An idol is absolutely anything. That you give affection to. Yes. I'm not talking about your wife. <laughs> Although you probably can make her an idol. Yes. Don't worship your wife. Don't worship your husband. They'll leave you pretty. <laughs> anyway. Um, but it's absolutely anything you give your primary affection to. See, because not even my wife, I love my wife. But not even my wife comes before my God. And for her, I don't come before her God. Because he is God alone. I'm not to be looked at like a God. She's not to I'd be a pretty uh, pretty short God. I don't even know if they made gods like that. <laughs> Did they? <laughs> uh, but she's not to be worshipped as a God. Hey, let me uh, start stepping on toes here. 
that sports team you love to watch? LSU. Oh, did I get some toes? That's not to be your God. He, the LSU doesn't deserve your primary affection. Uh, how about this one? Just reading this thing, that should not be your God. You need to know the God of it. He is your God. So you don't conform, you don't give your primary affection to anything but Him. He wants your heart. He wants your, He wants you. You don't even share a primary affection with anything other than Him. Because He is your God. Thou shalt not conform to the worship of their gods. You know what else? Don't conform to their economic system. Oh boy. Now listen, work. Because if you're a husband and you're not providing for your wife, you're worse than an infidel. <clears throat> Okay? So we should work. We're not called to laziness. But at the same time, I'm called to work. I'm called to trust in the provider. So if God is telling me to do something that's going to really, and He's done this a lot of times in history, He's asked somebody to do something that's really going to provide a cut in your pay. And you say, God, I can't do that. No, we got to we got to do things the way society does them. If I'm not working, I can't make money and I don't pay my bills. God, don't you understand this? Don't you understand that if I don't work, I don't get money, I can't pay bills. But if God is telling you to trust in Him for provision and to not trust the economic system that this world has created, I'll tell you something. He'll provide for you. There's a man, uh, his name's Torrance Nash. I'm sure you've heard of him. He might have even, I don't know if he's ever been here, but I'm sure you've heard of him. He goes to our family worship center all the time. Great preacher. And the Lord told him to leave his job. And he's been doing serious evangelistic work while keeping that job for a very long time. And to tell him to do that, it was a very serious thing. But the Lord was very strong. Do it. And he didn't just like quit the next week. He gave it prayer and time and devotion and, and really made sure that he had the mind of God. He said, quit your job. And the day that he was supposed to get his paycheck after he left that job, somebody sent him a check in the mail, not just to cover his paycheck, but it doubled his paycheck. Wow. See, because once you start trusting in God, and you can do this while you're working, maybe your job's not providing you everything that you need. <clears throat> maybe it doesn't give you all that you need. Well, God has more than your job could ever offer Amen. you. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Don't trust their economic system. Don't conform to their society. So that means even when you don't have it, give your tithe and your offering. Oh, don't talk about that. There's my money. We don't talk about my money in church. No, I'm serious. Because if you'll give your tithe and you'll give your offering, it's the only thing that God ever asks us to prove Him on. Amen. Prove me. Let me show you what I can do if you'll be faithful to support my work. Oh, God. If we would just not conform to that and we would conform to the way He provides, to the way that He can make a, a way where there is no way, watch out what God can do. Do not conform to their economic system. But you trust in my system. I have an economy. And you believe in that economy. Amen. <laughs> you do have to pay your taxes, though. Even Jesus did that. Do not conform to their sexual practices. One man, one woman. Listen, our society is telling us and throwing it in our face that it's not just one man and it is not just one woman. It can be man and man, woman and woman, or not anything and not anything. We got a messed up world we're living in here in the United States right. of America. Do not conform to it. Don't give in to it. In fact, look at it just like Phinehas looked at it. That's how we're supposed to be. Don't get comfortable with the way America's going. We should not be comfortable with the sexual practices that they're allowing in our nation. It should drive us to our knees. If we saw the severity of it that God saw in the way that they're acting and the things that they're doing, open our eyes, Lord. Let us really see it. It means don't... Uh, if, you, if you are... To, uh, it should be one man, one woman. You only in marriage. Only in marriage. So that means boyfriends and girlfriends. That stuff should not be happening. Don't conform. Don't do it. Don't live that way. But you should be like, uh, like the, the economy that God's laid out. One man, one woman. Do not conform to their songs. 
Don't sing their songs. Sing my songs. Don't listen to their music. Listen to my music. G uh, Paul taught us what we should be singing. He says in, in Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Don't conform to their song. If you sing anything, let it be to glorify Christ. Amen. Yeah. If you're listening to any music, let it glorify Christ. Well, I like that good old fashioned country music. I don't care what you like. Come on. Well, every now and then I like to listen to a couple rap songs. I don't care what you like. I'm telling you that that stuff's going to hurt you. That's right. It's filling your heart and your mind with unbelief and with doubt. Yes. Don't listen to it. Stop listening to it. Start listening to some good praise and worship music. Because I, oh man, what praise and worship music can do for you as you listen to it? How much faith it can cause to well up in your heart. What it can cause to do in your mind. How it can change everything. Just that one simple song when you're going through it. Don't conform to their song. Do not conform to their moral laws. So no matter what society says is right, if it goes against what God says is right, don't conform to it. I don't care what kind of laws we pass in America. If it does not agree with what God agrees with, you do not practice it. Amen. If, God ever, if, if America ever wrote a law that told you that you could not read your Bible, you can break that law. Now, you're supposed to keep the law of the land. Paul taught us that. But if it starts to take this away from you and take prayer away from you, just like Daniel. See, because they wrote a law to try to take prayer away from Daniel. You want to know what Daniel did? He prayed. He broke their law. Now, Daniel wasn't a rebellious man. He was high up in the government. So they wouldn't have given him a position if he was a rebellious man that just always broke the law. But he kept, the, he kept their law as long as it did not defy the word of God. And when it started to defy the word of God, Daniel broke their law. Do not adhere to any law that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Don't conform to their moral laws. Do not conform to the system in which they raise their children. Amen. Humanistic psychology is ruling the schoolhouse. Don't conform to that. You raise your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Parish, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't. I don't have kids. But I know what the Bible says. Amen. I know the Bible. Okay, so we're not to conform to the way they raise their children. Don't conform to the way the world treats other people. Love your enemy. <laughs> Amen. Huh? I'm not even going to start at loving your neighbor. Because <laughs> God's told us to love our enemy, and we have a hard time loving the guy sitting next to us. Come on. <laughs> love your neighbor. Love your enemies. Don't treat them the way the world tells you to treat them. Don't conform to that way. Do not conform to the way the world handles adversity. That means when you're going through something that looks like it's going to consume you, you don't need to run to the psychologist. You need to run to the prayer room. Come on. You need to get before God. Don't handle adversity the way that the world handles adversity. Don't start offering up your children as a sacrifice. Because <laughs> that's what they were doing. You know why God sent the children of Israel in there and told them, told them to wipe out everything? Because at one point he had told Abraham, I'm going to send people back 400 years after they're in bondage in Egypt. And I'm going to send them into the land because there was a certain group of people, and I forget the name, but it said that uh, the Bible says that they, their, uh, basically that their sin had not come to its full where it's going to get to when I actually do send judgment on them. The children of Israel went in as God's judgment. That's why God told him told them to wipe out everything. It's because the iniquity had not yet been fulfilled. But at the point in time when it was fulfilled, God sent the children of Israel in there to take the land that belonged to them and to rid it of all the evil. So if you ever read through the Old Testament, you wonder why is God doing that? That's why God's doing that, because the iniquity had been fulfilled. So do not conform to the way the world handles adversity. Do not talk like the world talks. What did, Paul said, let your, let your speech be always with grace. Lord, help. Season with salt that you would know how you ought to every, uh, answer every man. It's one of the first passages God really dealt with me on when I first got saved. The way you talk, it should always be with grace. 
seasoned with salt. The Word of God. Now I should know the Word. I should be able to communicate it. And if I did that, if I had that in my heart, then I would know how to give an answer in every situation, even when it's stressful. I have a lot to learn. Ephesians 4 and 29, let not corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Stop cussing. Quit talking dirty. Quit telling dirty jokes. Stop all of that. It's enough. Don't do that anymore. Stop it. Don't conform. Amen. Be like me because I'm holy and you are my people. He wants you to be holy because He is. He wants you to be holy because He is. And He wants you to be holy because He just wants us to be holy for Him. Leviticus 20 and 26, it says, And you shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have, and have served you, have severed you from other people, that you should be mine. You're mine. Do this for me. You know, everything that you should do, you should do for Him. Even regarding holiness. He is holy. He wants holiness. So be holy because He wants it. And if we would get a hold of that, I just want to please Him. Right? The will. Again. Uh, be holy because if you're not, it will profane my name. So when you're in line at the grocery store and that cashier is just running her mouth to the person to her, to the other worker behind her at Walmart, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you go to Baton Rouge, you will, you know. And you're sitting there just getting irritated. Woman, well, come on. And you get up there and you're all agitated and she can tell it. And you're miserable. You wish you weren't there. Walmart. Nobody wants to go to Walmart. And nobody wants to deal with the woman who's talking to other employees the whole time. Anyway. Right? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. But if you act out, even if you show that agitation, you're profaning the name of God. Come on. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to deal in every situation. We are not perfect. We have a long ways to go. But I'm just telling you, you can be. You don't have to do that anymore. So he's calling for holiness. And the New Testament tells us we need to be holy. So now how? How can I do that? You know what he actually said in the book of Leviticus? He said, uh, well, that's not where I want to be. If I can get to it. I must not have put it in. But in Leviticus, he said, Be ye holy, for I am the Lord God who sanctifies you. So he told us that it wasn't our responsibility to perform this work within ourselves, but that he himself would do it. Amen. And then if you go to Romans chapter 6 and 19, it says, So I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your member servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now, we have got to follow this, even so now yield your member servants to righteousness unto holiness. What is righteousness? What is the only righteousness that exists in this world today? It is what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. That is the only, that is the most righteous act that's ever happened in the earth. Amen. What Christ did at Calvary. So if I'm yielding my, ser my members' servants to what Christ did at Calvary, okay, you got to follow that by faith. I'm yielding my body. Present yourselves to me as a living sacrifice. Okay, I'm yielding my body by faith in what Christ did at Calvary, yielding it to God in turn. That should naturally produce holiness. If I am living the crucified life, I am naturally living a life of holiness. Amen. This is what should be happening. We want to know what happens? Our hearts grow cold and despondent. We get used to the flow of life and we quit evaluating things and we get used to and comfortable with the way we are. Stop being comfortable. Stop being comfortable with the way you are now. Because God wants to do greater things in your heart than ever before. Right now, today, there is something God wants to deliver you from. And He can do it today. You don't even have to keep carrying it for another year. You can let it go today. I can let it go today. Oh God, if He would just remove us from this comfortable life. And literally... <laughs> Just like the, uh, the eagle, when the eagle's ready to get the, the baby out of the nest, starts removing all the soft layers of the nest. 
all those soft layers and start pricking the feet of that baby. And that baby, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> and then throws it out of the nest. Can't fly, but throws it out. And right before that baby will hit the ground, mama comes down and swoops up, catches it, does it again. Until that baby learns to fly, keep dropping it. Uncomfortable, scared, terrified. Can't figure it out. <laughs> Lee loved it. Let me do it again. <laughs> but just let you get uncomfortable. You know what? We need some uncomfortableness in our lives. I want to learn to fly. I want to learn to live for God the way He desires me to live for Him. And you know what? When I do, I'm going to be flying. Because that is where you get up into the heavens and you're just with God. <laughs> That's where I want to be. Yes. I want to be with the Lord. Yes. I want to be walking before Him the way He wants. I want to learn to fly. So God, get, get me uncomfortable. Let me experience some uncomfortable circumstances and situations so that I'll get out of this lifestyle of complacency. Talk about something that murders the church. It's complacency. And Lord, deal with me. There is more you want to do in my heart. This is definitely not one of those shouting messages. Amen? Amen. But it's teaching us that we have, uh, we need, uh, how do I say, we need God to literally fill us with a zeal just to live for Him. Amen. Yeah, amen. Just to live for Him. Amen. You really don't need a zeal. Let me tell you something. If you want a zeal to reach people, God's first going to have to give you a zeal to live for Him. Yeah, I want to reach people. I do. I want God to set me on fire and send me out into the world and let me blaze for Him. See souls one into the kingdom. That is the cry of my heart. God's, I believe God's going to help us to do that in middle schools and in high schools and on college campuses. I really believe that. God's opened a door already and we're starting to move forward in that and we're just doing the best that we can to get into these public high schools. And God's going to do it. But you want to know what the problem would be? What would be a shame? Is that if I walk into one of those high schools and we're ready to preach the gospel to 300 students and my life doesn't please God at all. I don't want to do anything for God. I don't want to do any work for God. If I'm not pleasing Him every day, if I'm not pleasing Him when I'm alone with her <laughs> at home, am I pleasing Him then? God forbid that I, I'm just a hypocrite walking around out here with a mask on every day. And I go home and I take that mask off and I'm just this evil, angry, bitter person. Whoa. Lord, help us. And with that being said, let us all stand to our feet. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I know that it's, a, it's definitely a challenging message because you try putting it together. <laughs> challenged from the very moment that you start writing. Thank you, Lord. Challenged from the very moment that you even, the thought even comes into your mind. I remember about two weeks ago, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, you're supposed to be different. And he was showing me that in Hebrews chapter 12. I told Michaela across, I was sitting at work when the Lord started dealing with, dealing with me with it about it. She sits across from me. I said, I'm going to preach a message one day entitled, You're Strange. You're strange. You're weird. Because Abraham confessed that he was a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. We are different. We are supposed to be different. And we're supposed to be changing. So that we become more and more different. Because let me tell you something. People don't need. People in this world don't need to see the same thing they're seeing. Because they'll just stay the same. They need to see someone walking by them in this dark world that is so bright. With the love of God. And the grace of God in their hearts. That's what people need. Amen. Amen. That's what this world needs. That's even what the church needs. Somebody that's ablaze with the glory of God. So I'm asking for my own life today. And I'm asking for your lives today. That God would create a desperation within us. To want to be more like Him. Amen. To want to be more like He is. Because He is holy. So be ye holy. 